Caregiving can sometimes feel like an impossible struggle. Caregivers may be torn between taking care of loved ones and trying to maintain balance in life. The good news is that it doesn't have to be that way. The Caring Generation with host Pamela D. Wilson is here to focus on the conversation of caring. You're not alone. In fact, you're in exactly the right place to share stories and learn tips and resources to help you and your loved ones. So now, please welcome the host of The Caring Generation, Pamela D. Wilson. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, speaker, consultant, and guardian of the Caring Generation. The Caring Generation focuses on the conversation of caring, giving us permission to talk about aging, the challenges of caregiving, and everything in between. It's no surprise that needing care or becoming a caregiver changes everything. The Caring Generation is here to guide you along the journey to let you know that you're not alone. You are in exactly the right place to share stories and learn about caregiving programs and resources to help you and your loved ones plan for what's ahead. Invite your parents, spouses, family, friends, colleagues, co-workers, and everyone you know to listen to the show available on podcast apps worldwide. If you have a question or an idea for a future program, Share your idea with me by commenting on my social media posts on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. You can also go to my website, PamelaDWilson.com, click on the Contact Me button and complete the caregiver survey. I receive those emails and I personally review and respond to every one. Welcome to the Caring Generation podcast and this week's episode number 175, Why Medicaid is So Difficult to Understand. If you are a family caregiver or a person who needs care, learning how to navigate the healthcare system can be a tricky, sticky wicket initially. This can involve attending doctor appointments, going for a couple of tests or treatments, filling prescriptions, and managing health issues that can range from high blood pressure to diabetes, kidney disease, arthritis, depression, cancer, or memory loss. With age, we all will experience some type of health concern as our bodies begin to get tired and wear out. If you care for an aging parent or a spouse or even yourself, You know that one accident that results in an injury or experiencing some unexpected health event like a heart attack or even the flu can truly change life overnight. A person perfectly healthy one day can be hospitalized three hours later or the next day. An aging parent can be independent one day, break a hip, and be in a nursing home for physical rehab a few days later. While we never imagine that any of these things can or will happen, they do. And so this is the discussion for the show. When elderly parents or a spouse need care and money is very, very limited, how do they get care? How do they access care? This brings up the topic of Medicare and Medicaid and the question of why is Medicaid so difficult to understand? So I want to start with Medicare because this leads to Medicaid. Medicare is health insurance for people over age 65. Not everybody automatically qualifies and here's a few examples. So people who have fewer than 40 Social Security credits and What that equates to is 40 credits are about equal to 10 years of paid work. Now, there are some jobs that do not pay into Social Security. The only way you get money out of Social Security is if you put money into Social Security. So in a sense, it's kind of like a bank account or a savings account for your retirement. People who may not pay into Social Security might be teachers, some railroad employees, people who work for the federal government, persons like that. So Medicare 
is a replacement for private health insurance. So private health insurance is if you work for a company and your company has insurance, that's usually called private health insurance. So when you retire and you are 65 or older and you've paid into Social Security, you can apply for Medicare. Now, there are some other circumstances for Medicare, like a condition called end-state renal disease that people under age 65 can receive. But to keep this conversation very simple, we're limiting the discussion of Medicare and Medicaid to people only over age 65 because there's so much more. So there's a lot of confusion about what Medicare pays for when a person is older. Now, if we look at this from the opposite perspective, that may be the easiest way to say what Medicare does not pay for. So you're a caregiver and your parents have health issues and they need non-medical types of care to stay in their home and live independently. That type of care, Medicare does not pay for. So technically, anything that you as a caregiver does for your loved one with the assumption that you are not a doctor or a nurse or any type of healthcare professional is not reimbursable by Medicare. This realization that Medicare does not pay for everything. It doesn't pay for daily living assistance. This comes as quite a shock to many elderly and especially to their children who are their caregivers. So, Medicare is even going to the extent of providing training for family caregivers in some areas, like training to administer insulin, the use of dialysis machines at home, or physical therapy. And the goal of this is that the burden of care shifts from Medicare to family caregivers. You may hear something like healthcare providers saying, well, you know, the home is the new hospital. Well, over time, this will be true as families and loved ones will be expected to bear more of the work that the healthcare system does today to care for aging loved ones because healthcare is so ridiculously expensive. So you might be wondering, well then, Pamela, what does Medicare pay for? Well, Medicare pays for the basics like medical appointments, vaccinations, hospitalizations, short-term nursing care stays if you have Medicare B and other types of medical care, but it's at an 80% rate, meaning that older adults are still responsible to pay for the other 20% of care costs. Now, if you watch television, you're seeing all these commercials saying, oh, get this Medicare program and you will not pay anything and you'll get all these wonderful benefits. Well, that can be somewhat true. Be suspicious though, ask the questions. Those advertisements are for other types of insurance, usually called Advantage plans like Kaiser Permanente, Humana, United Healthcare. And those plans replace what I call plain vanilla Medicare. And some do offer a lot of benefits depending on where you live. Here's the catch though. They all have in-network providers, which means that you pay less if you see doctors only in the Kaiser Permanente system and if you go to hospitals associated with Kaiser. The same thing for Humana and United Healthcare. So if you want to go outside of any of these systems, you will pay a much higher cost or your insurance company may not pay at all. Now traditional Medicare goes by similar rules, right? Because not all physicians have to accept Medicare. So finding a physician who accepts Medicare or really any of these Advantage plans can be quite a challenge. Now, any physician at any time can decide to not accept Medicare or one of these plans and discontinue that service and then patients have to go find a new physician. Medicare is a federally funded program. Now let's talk about Medicaid and why it can be so difficult to understand. And again, we're limiting our discussion of Medicaid to people over age 65 because there are Medicaid programs for people under 65, but that's a whole nother long podcast. <laughs> so people over age 65 can be eligible for Medicare like we talked, Medicare Advantage plans, straight Medicaid, Medicaid managed care plans, 
or something called the PACE program, which is the program of all-inclusive for the elderly. Medicaid is a combined federal and state plan, and it's usually a program for older adults and people who have disabilities, like disabilities that they were born with at birth or that they acquired during their life. The caveat here is the program is different by every state. So if you live in Colorado and you have a friend who lives in Florida and you're both on Medicaid, you may not both have access to the same programs. And so this is where the question comes in. The question of how can adult children avoid paying for care for elderly parents who have very little income and no money in their bank accounts. It's Medicaid. If your parent is low income and they have some pretty significant health problems, they may be able to qualify for Medicaid. This is super important. Do not wait until the last minute to investigate this and figure out how it works. Because the processing time for a Medicaid application can be a month or it can be a year, depending on where you live. And even then, once you're approved, there may be wait lists for Medicaid services. Do your homework. Call your county office of health and human services to find out about the requirements for filing for Medicaid, have them refer you to the agency that handles Medicaid, get your questions answered. Then start asking more questions. What does Medicaid in my state pay for? Now generally, for older adults, Medicaid pays for something called home and community-based services. It might be abbreviated as HCBS, Harry, Charlie, Brad, Sam. And Medicare pays for long-term care referred to as LTC or long-term care services and supports, which could be abbreviated LTSS. Now there's other programs, but again, I'm trying to keep this discussion very narrow to make Medicaid a little easier to understand and talk about the two programs that most older people use. If mom and dad live at home and they're low income, Again, this is defined by your state Medicaid office, so check with them. And if your parents require assistance with what are called activities of daily living, ADLs, Apple, David, Larry, or if they have early memory loss, they might qualify for in-home assistance. That in-home assistance would include help with what are called these activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So they are things that you might be helping your parents with, like bathing, dressing, managing their ability to go to the toilet, incontinence, help with them getting out of bed or standing up from a chair that a person might experience if they are physically weak or if they have balance issues. Now, in-home caregivers provided by Medicaid can also do some other things like assist with laundry, prepare some meals, they can remind your parents to take medications and do a little bit of light housekeeping and maybe some other projects. So a commonly asked question from caregivers on this topic. Are these caregivers trained, reliable, and trustworthy? My response to this is just as with any business or any person. The qualifications of the employees vary as honestly does the interest of the person in the position. To be perfectly honest, you may have to work with an agency and go through two or three caregivers until you find one that's a good match for your parents or yourself. You may also have to go through one or more agencies. As a result of COVID and problems with staffing, retaining home care workers is a huge challenge. Now in some states, Medicaid programs will pay family members to be a caregiver. But caveat, in these cases, it's very important to take a serious look at this trade-off if you are that caregiver, because it may appear ideal. But if you're giving up employment, a job in your independence, how long are you going to be happy doing this, and how difficult will it be for you to become re-employed? I'll tell you, it's going to be a lot harder than you think. 
Consider the value of the benefits that you're giving up, your health insurance, your ability to save for your retirement and live your life. I see so many caregivers jump into this and they don't think about the trade-offs and the effect on their lives, their family, relationships, friends, their income, and their level of independence. So before you consider giving up a job to have Medicaid pay you to care for an aging parent, really give this a lot of very serious, serious consideration. Don't do it lightly or on a whim. So let's talk about the list of things that caregivers don't think about until a loved one needs to apply for Medicaid. Here's a few. As a caregiver, never commingle your funds or bank accounts. This can give the appearance that you're the one spending your parents' money if Medicaid is looking at this. Do not pay your parents' bills or buy things for them with your money and then expect to be reimbursed. Medicaid will question these activities and they do not look upon this very fondly. In most states, there's a five-year look-back period on all applications to see if assets like money or property were commingled in bank accounts or if children reimbursed themselves for the expenses of their parents. They look for this. And I'll give you an example. So I was a care manager for over 20 years. An elderly client of mine gave her granddaughter $60,000 for her wedding. A year later, my client became ill and needed to do a Medicaid application for which she was denied because she gave away $60,000 that could have been used to pay for her care. So if you're older, conserve your money. Don't give it away. Or if you're going to give it away, give it away according to the charitable contributions that are allowed by IRS regulatory codes. Now, here's another issue. I hear adult children all the time making angry comments about how terrible Medicaid is because it can take their parents' money or their parents' house. So think about this for a minute. If you need a car, nobody just gives you a car, right? Normally you have to pay for it, right? You take out a loan, you pay the loan back over time. If you wanna buy groceries, is somebody just giving you groceries? Not usually, you have to pay for the groceries. So the question here is why is there an expectation that the government should pay for care for the elderly if the elderly have assets to pay on their own. Now, when it comes to Medicaid, there are a lot of different opinions. There are people who need Medicaid, are approved, they appreciate the assistance, and they benefit hugely from the services. Just the opposite, I know a lot of elderly people who refuse to go on Medicaid because they don't want to take a handout. They don't want to be on public benefits. That to them is a negative. Then, like I mentioned, you have a long list of children who want their inheritance and they're really angry that if their parents have money, they should pay for their own care. <laughs> so on this topic, states have something called a state recovery, which means that some states will place a lien on a home to recover the money after a person on Medicaid passes away. Again, similar to buying a car, it's no different than taking out a loan and then paying it back. If you have parents, they earn their money, they bought their home. It's okay to use that to pay for their care. If you're an adult today, work and save your money so that you have money to pay for your care when you're older. Then you won't have to rely on Medicaid to take care of you. Everybody dreams of retirement, and I will tell you, based on my experience caring for older people for so many years, since actually 2000, right? Going on 23 years. Retirement is not this dream that everybody imagines it to be. Your income, in most cases, decreases. Health expenses go through the roof because you have more health problems, especially if you were not attentive to your health when you were younger. By exercising, eating a good diet, managing stress, and all the other aspects that contribute to well-being. If you don't do that when you're older, your health is going to show it. Which is not to say that a perfectly healthy person today cannot die tomorrow. It happens all the time. But during retirement, the cost of everything continues to go up, your income stays the same, your health gets worse. These are things that nobody likes to talk about or that anyone really gives a lot of thought to until you are a caregiver caring for a loved one who can't pay their rent, pay their prescriptions, buy groceries, or pay for other medical costs. 
utilities, property taxes, HOA payments, mortgages, groceries, gasoline, homeowners insurance, car insurance. These rates go up every single year. It's no wonder that older people struggle to pay their bills. So for a minute, let's go back to that topic of giving up a job to be paid by Medicaid to care for a loved one. Think about all these things I just mentioned, the short and long-term effects of giving up income that you will never get back. While many caregivers can feel guilty about not caring for a loved one, a hard fact of life is that our health problems are the result of our life when we were younger. They're the result of how we took care of ourselves or how we didn't. These are the difficult and very emotional challenges of life. Watching a loved one's health, it's heartbreaking. Being the person who is sick all the time is not a joyful experience. Nor is being the person diagnosed with cancer, whose family pressures him or her to have chemotherapy or radiation, without really understanding how this affects that person's quality of life. If you want to have choices, plan early. Be clear about the care you want or don't want so that your children who are your caregivers don't take over your life and make all the decisions for you while they're waiting to inherit your money. If you want choices, you have to create choices for yourself. Create your medical and power of attorney documents today. Appoint somebody that you trust even if this person is not one of your children or even your spouse. Create your living will and a will. We'll take a short break and I'll return to answer common questions about Medicaid. I'm Pamela D. Wilson. You're with me on The Caring Generation. There are over 170 episodes. You can find all of the episodes on your favorite podcast and music apps. Just go on there and search for The Caring Generation. Also visit my website, PamelaDWilson.com, where you'll find a library of articles, my blog, and an in-depth online caregiver program. Stay with me. I'll be right back. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, advocate, and speaker. We're back with more discussions about why is Medicaid so difficult to understand. We're going to go through three additional questions. The first question is, why are Medicaid beds in nursing homes so limited? Or if I put this the way the caregiver asked the question, why do nursing homes not like Medicaid patients? Well, it's not that they don't like Medicaid patients, but here's the information that you may not know that's behind the scenes. Federal and state government funds pay for Medicaid services. Nursing homes and some assisted living communities that accept Medicaid are paid a flat daily rate. That rate is usually just below the break-even amount of the per day cost to care for the individual. So if you were a business, would you want to lose money or break even on every client that you served or every service that you provided? If you did, how would you stay in business? How would you pay your staff or yourself? This loss of money is why some nursing homes have such a poor reputation. Because if their resident population becomes unbalanced with more Medicaid patients, then patients that are under Medicare or private insurance, those companies pay more, right? So this is why nursing homes can take some Medicaid patients because if they lose a little bit of money over here, they're making money on the other side. But when the number of Medicaid patients exceeds patients for whom they get money for, the nursing homes close down because they can't pay their operating costs. Now the government doesn't own these nursing homes. Private companies, nonprofit organizations, or investor groups own the nursing homes. So there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a business that earns a profit. Think of this. Would you go to work every day and instead of getting a paycheck, you paid the company you worked for $10 a day just to show up there every day? That's the reality of Medicaid, not only in nursing homes, 
and doctor's offices, but in many other places and services. The companies that offer Medicaid have to find a way to balance the losses, the financial losses for Medicaid, with the profitable side of their business. So the second question is, how long does it take for Medicaid to approve an application? Well, this is a tricky one too, because the answer is that approvals depend on the, one, the accuracy of the application. So if you included all the information that they needed and what I call the backlog in each state. In Colorado here, I've had applications approved in eight weeks. Some took 12 months. Couple of super important points here. Keep a copy of the entire application that you submit. So if they tell you that you forgot to include something, you know whether you did or didn't, and you can supply it. Also, if you hand deliver your application, make sure to get a date and time stamped receipt and note the name of the person to whom you delivered the application. If you submit the application online, make sure you receive some type of a reference number and a confirmation of receipt. I will tell you that applications get lost all the time. Sometimes they will even tell you that you never even delivered it. Again, keep an entire copy so that you have a record. Keep that record of delivery. Then I recommend being the squeaky wheel. Call every week to find out the status of the application. This allows you to make sure that the application is still there somewhere and somebody is working on it and you have a name. As I mentioned earlier in the program, you don't want to wait until the last minute to apply because approvals can actually take months and there can be super, super long wait lists for services or even to be accepted into programs. Here's question number three. And this one is probably one of the most important for you as a caregiver. And it's about being an advocate. So this is a true story. So caregiver said, well, you know, our, mother's com our mother complained of pain and the nursing home did really nothing. And she ended up dying. And in our opinion, it was because the nursing home didn't do their job. What can we do? Well, the answer to this question is twofold. First, it's that as a caregiver of a loved one, you've got to be the squeaky wheel. You have to be the advocate who goes and tries to do your best to get care for your loved one. And I'll, I'll share a story about this in a minute because even that doesn't always work out the way you expect. But my first suggestion here is to research the Affordable Care Act, Section 3025. It's called rehospitalization because you want to understand why hospitals don't like to accept older people and why nursing homes don't like to send older people back to the hospital. The reason is that hospitals are penalized. If an older person comes to the hospital and goes to a nursing home for care and that person comes back to the hospital. The same goes for if an older person is hospitalized and admitted, goes home and comes back. So let's say you have a parent who broke a hip and for example, most hospitals, they're gonna have a nursing home. They're gonna say, well, you know, send mom or dad here for rehab. And what you don't know is that that nursing home probably agreed or has an agreement with the hospital that they're gonna do everything in their power not to send your parent back to the hospital. Because if that happens, the financial liability to the hospital, they are penalized, right? And then the hospital's not happy with the nursing home because they sent your parent back. Now, separately, nursing homes like to think that they have doctors and they know best, but I can tell you in my experience, you know the best as the caregiver. You know what your parents' health is like. You know how to advocate. So unless you are a family member who becomes very active in the care of your parent, even though mom or dad is really sick and they may need to go to the hospital, the nursing home may refuse to send your parent to the hospital, or the staff honestly may not even notice that your parent is sick. My recommendation is that you ask the staff at the nursing home to call 911 and that you do if they do not. Now realize there is a risk to this because if your parent really isn't sick and doesn't need the hospitalization, the nursing home can get angry and say that you took your parent out of there against their recommendations and then they refuse to accept your parent back in the nursing home. So this is a very tricky situation. So on the topic of advocating for a loved one who is in a nursing home and who is sick, True story, and this is my true story. Years ago, a client of mine was in a nursing home and I suspected that she had pneumonia. She was sent to the emergency room who turned her right back around and sent her back to the nursing home saying, nothing's wrong with this person. 
Now, I knew why, because admitting an elderly person with pneumonia who might be discharged and returned to that hospital would cost the hospital money. They would be penalized. So they didn't want to accept her and they didn't even want to treat her. Now, the other thing there is older people with pneumonia might need an intensive care bed. Now, those beds are pretty hard to come by, and hospitals honestly would rather give an intensive care bed to a young person who is more likely to survive than an older person who might possibly die. So, day one, I suspected my client had pneumonia. We had her sent to the emergency room. Emergency room sent her back to the nursing home. In the meantime, because I was worried, me and my staff, we called the doctors on call to ask them to visit and prescribe antibiotics or something. But because the hospital said nothing was wrong, they refused. Day two, my client is so much worse. She's coughing, she's wheezing, she's got yellow gunk coming out of her nose and her throat. Called 911 again. Unfortunately, they took her back to the same hospital, emergency room, who again said, you know what? There is nothing wrong with her. They sent her right back to the nursing home. We made more calls to the doctors for assistance and they did nothing. They were not even available. Day three, client is much worse. Called 911. But this time, the client was sent to a different hospital. Unfortunately for my client, by this time, her pneumonia was so advanced that she died two days later. Now, this is an example of a very experienced care management team, me and my staff, who under the worst of circumstances couldn't convince the health care system to treat an elderly woman. So if you are an older person or if you're a family member, know that these situations can and they will happen and you may do everything you can and your loved one still may die, not because of something that you didn't do, but because of the healthcare system's denial to treat. My opinion, a lot of healthcare systems see anyone over age 65 as old and disposable. They also group older people together as having the same concerns. So a healthy 65 year old who hikes 10 miles a day could be viewed the same as a person who is 65 with Alzheimer's or dementia. Fact is that many healthcare staff are biased against care for the elderly. There's research studies that show this to be a fact. So my advice, regardless of your age, 20, 30, 40, 50, 80, take care of your health. Work and save for your retirement so that you have choices about your care. Become an advocate for yourself so that you get the care you want from the healthcare system. There's a whole course on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, about this. Don't accept no if you believe that you need care fight for yourself because no one else will. Insurance companies, they are quick to deny claims knowing that patients are not going to fight for their care. Most people give up and that's a sad fact of life. Being elderly and getting the care you need can be a real fight. And for everybody else out there, get involved in your state health care initiatives. I know this means getting involved in politics, which few people want to do these days. But the fact is that the government runs the healthcare system. State politicians vote in bills that have unintended consequences for consumers and patients. They waste a lot of money, they are duplicative programs, and this is because the politicians have no idea what they're doing. It's because they get paid by healthcare organizations and lobbyists to vote a certain way. The only people left to stop this from happening is us. It's the consumers and the patients who are most affected by the decisions of people who do not live in our shoes every day. Politicians vote where the money comes from. The healthcare lobby, healthcare systems, and companies. Patients and consumers, we do not have a chance unless we begin to speak up. So I encourage you to get involved, and I encourage you to learn as much about Medicaid and Medicare programs and healthcare as you can. There is a course on my website. It is complimentary, no charge, PamelaDWilson.com. Go to How I Help, look up Caring for Aging Parents, that online course. I thank you all for being here. Please check out the other 170 plus episodes and share this podcast with everybody that you know so that we can extend the support and education and love that so many caregivers and the elderly who receive care need. 
This is Pamela D. Wilson. I'm a caregiving expert. You're with me on The Caring Generation. I look forward to being with you all again soon. God bless you all. Kisses and love to everybody. Sleep well tonight. Have a fabulous day tomorrow and enjoy each day until we are here together again. Tune in each week for The Caring Generation with host Pamela D. Wilson. Come join the conversation and see how Pamela can provide solutions and peace of mind for everyone. Here on Pamela D. Wilson's The Caring Generation.